Good afternoon. So I'm Erica Mallory Blythe. I'm the founder of FIRE, which stands for Physicians Health Initiative for Radiation and Environment. And I've been asked to come and talk about protecting children's health in school, particularly with a focus on the use of non-ionising radiation. I sit on a number of different international boards and advisory groups. Now the truth is in schools I think actually there's a lot of different areas where we could really do with some health optimization, and it'd be nice to kind of do a workshop on all of these things but some of them do key in with um, this issue that we're going to focus on. So natural light versus light from screens or different types of overhead lighting and mental health support and some of these other things we'll bring in a little. Um, so I'm going to try to cover, we're going to have a quick overview of the electromagnetic spectrum and how that works with biology essentially. A, a little bit on current safety limits, um, the evidence because I think that's really important, we're an evidence-based society and that's something that's absolutely essential if we want this to be perceived credibly. Common misconceptions and then moving forward in hopefully a healthier way. And I think I want to just start with a moment of introspection for all of you to, to ask, are you healthy as individuals? Because I'm really concerned that culturally here in the UK, we have come to tolerate a certain level of ill health as being perfectly normal and that we're teaching our children that. And it's one thing to make decisions about dismissing ill health ourselves, but to do that for our kids is quite another story. And I, I'm concerned that we have a somewhat of an epidemic of kids who have a lot of different subtle problems, whether they're not sleeping or they have behavioural problems. Um, we have certain types of cancers rising. And some children are getting headaches at school. And there's sometimes a little bit of a kind of man-up attitude that until it's bad enough to where you need to get a doctor involved and you have a diagnosis or a label, that we're pushing it to the back. And I think actually we need to be doing the exact opposite. We need to be teaching kids to cue into their bodies, to take, things, to take subtle, soft signs of ill health seriously and discuss those in a healthy way. Not to be preoccupied or over, overly concerned, but so that parents are aware that actually poor sleep is not normal. That's a problem for a child. Headaches are not normal. That's an issue. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about some of the changes in modern society and modern schools and how I think those are affecting health. And this is a big question, not one that I'm answering this debate, except on a very humble level to say that in my former life in A&E departments and in intensive care, life is very simple to us. It's electricity. It's electromagnetism. That's what it is. In the intensive care department, sometimes we have no other sign of life, no active breathing, sometimes no pulse at various points. And what gives us a clue as to whether there's resurrectable life in there is electromagnetism. From the brain, from the heart, that's an action potential of a muscle. When we can see that, we know that there may be something that we can bring back to life. So on a very simple and crude level, it's the essence of life that we're using now in our technological devices. And we don't just put out electromagnetic fields from our heart and our brain. We, we are actually designed to cue and take cues from the environment, from very, very subtle, low-level electromagnetic fields also. Your DNA is a fractal antenna. It's been deliberately designed to receive electromagnetic fields. And so have other structures in the body, like, um, and we'll come on to this actually when we talk a bit later on. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum as a whole is quite broad and all of you will be aware, I'm sure, that ionising radiation is known to cause cancer and other ill health problems. Uh, but for many years we were taught, even as doctors, that the non-ionising portion was relatively biologically inert, it wasn't doing anything. That's not correct at all and all portions of this spectrum can interfere with health in many serious ways. We're going to focus here in this talk about the radio frequency, and th this actually envelops microwaves. So all of the radio communication device frequencies, and you'll be familiar with all of these apparatus that we're using so prolifically, and more that are coming on the market on literally a daily basis, including things like wearables for, new for newborns. Um, I've got some frustrations because um, there's... Uh, there's a lot of debate going on about this at the moment, especially with the rollout of 5G. And so I've been asked to do interviews in the media, on the radio and in newspapers, and I'm, they always uh, present the oppositional view, which is quite healthy and quite correct. But at the moment, that oppositional viewpoint is saying things like, don't worry about radio waves, they're the same as sunlight. And that's scientifically ludicrous. Um, 
there are so many differences, but a GCSE physics student can tell you, well, sunlight doesn't pass, the, the visible portion doesn't pass through a wall, radio waves do. There's a lot of profound differences between those parts of the spectrum. All of the different parts have a lot of differences in terms of how they interact with biology. But the other thing that they'll often say is, don't worry about radio waves because they've always been in our environment. They were here before man evolved. And there's some truth in that, but it's a gross distortion of reality. So we have created intensities of RF radiation that are a billion, billion times higher than natural background levels. That's technically a quintillion. So the intensity is dramatically different. But in addition to that, we, you can see this natural radio quiet zone that happened at around a gigahertz. That's in green there. And we filled in with anthropogenic or man-made fields that exact area that was naturally a radio quiet zone. That's, you can see in, uh, over the years and up to 2010 in red. And that's the area that we're continuing to fill in with new technologies. So the intensity is dramatically different. And the frequency ranges are really quite different to background radiation. And not only that, but this has happened incredibly fast. In evolutionary terms, this has happened in the blink of an eye or beat of a heart. It's happened in my lifetime and continues to rise exponentially. Now, medicine, we, we're often honest enough to say that a lot of the new procedures that are introduced, we can't say those are safe until they've really seen out not just one generation, but several, and been properly, and this is very important, properly analysed in an experimental capacity. But you would all expect, and everyone does, I, I expected this at the beginning of my journey, that we have safety limits that make sense that are in place to protect us. Unfortunately, that is not true here in the UK. Some would argue it's not true anywhere at the moment globally. What we use here in the UK are called the ICNIRP guidelines. They were devised in the 90s to protect against tissue heating, to pr protect against thermal effects, actual heating of cells. They do not protect against the copiously documented low intensity exposures. And don't take my word for that, this is the, um, F this is the United States Environmental Protection Agency pointing out in the last line here, this generalization that these guidelines protect um, against all health effects is not justified. And many countries have taken a, a more responsible approach to this information than us. And you can see us, uh, unforgivably, with the most relaxed standards on the planet. And all of these other countries with safety, safety limits that are orders of magnitude below ours. Now, we've become a little bit mechanism obsessed, um, is the truth. Um, I mentioned that I, I sort of grew up, if you like, in medically and evidence-based society, which I did. And I full-heartedly support that. Of course, we need evidence for our approaches in medicine. But what we mustn't do is, if we think A course is B, and we have really good, robust information that demonstrates that, we mustn't let, let a lack of understanding of every single step between A and B stop us from giving sensible public health advice. That's happened before with other environmental toxins, and it's exactly what's happening now. But... Don't let me confuse you into thinking there aren't legitimate mechanisms, because there absolutely are. And those are, these have increased a lot over the last decade or so. These are some of the mechanisms. Um, induction of reactive oxygen species. That's something called oxidative stress, which causes damaging, aging, degeneration of cells. Altered calcium handling, and I'll expand on that a little in a moment. Alteration of gene expression, DNA damage via both genetic and epigenetic routes, inhibition of DNA repair. The other thing that's being said on the radio a lot is don't worry because non-ionizing radiation, if it can't ionize, it can't do damage at all. Again, scientifically utterly incorrect as evidenced by thousands of peer-reviewed published papers. This is just one mechanism of likely many that are all taking place simultaneously. But I, this is the work of Professor Martin Paul. And one of the reasons that I've gravitated towards it and I use it is because it's actually quite an easy one to explain. All doctors understand this because we're all taught heavily about the voltage-gated calcium channels that sit in the cell membrane. They're really important in terms of messaging and cascades into systemic behavior. And these fields can open up these calcium channels and allow calcium to influx into the cell in higher concentrations than it should be. And this sets up a cycle of what we call nit nitrosative stress. It's the type of um, the oxidative damage I talked to you at the beginning about. Now, th 
This is very strong in the literature. This is the other reason I'm citing this mechanism, is when you look at reviews, when you look at large numbers of papers, if you look at papers that are searching for the effect of oxidative stress from EMF, you see a very high percentage that say, yes, we're seeing it. Often in excess of 90%, sometimes over 80%, but lots of different reviews all showing very high proportion of the literature. And this just happens to be from um, The Lancet, a colleague of mine, Prebandara, at Orsa, which is one of the groups I'm an advisor for. And um, some key points from this again show this is 89, and that's out of 300 studies, so really nice, strong evidence base. Um, and this is from the Bioinitiative Report. I'm going to speak about them again in a moment, but they're an independent working group who have deliberately been set up to, independently from industry, analyse very large quantities of literature. And they've looked at many thousands of studies. It was at about 5,000 when I asked them in 2016, I think, and it, it's, it's gone on since then. But again, um, finding a very high proportion of positive studies looking at oxidative stress. Now... The thing with oxidative stress is because it affects cells, if it affects multiple different cell types, that means it's obviously going to affect multiple different systems. So we know that there's a very high concentration of symptoms in the central nervous system. All of these and many more. And if you mess with your central nervous system, that can have knock-on effects on all your other systems. But in addition to that, there are some direct effects on those systems as well. And I'm talking here about problems with hormonal disruption, immune suppression, reproductive impairment, the list goes on. So lots of different areas of your body are going to be affected. And if you've got different cell types and then different systems, I'm going up the levels, that's obviously going to lead you to different endpoints in terms of disease. Now, all of these are linked with oxidative stress in general. Um, but then to bring that a bit more focused into the EMF literature, all of these have been linked with electromagnetic field exposure. And when I first put this slide together, loosely speaking, I arranged diseases on this side that were more common in older populations, perhaps, and then ones on the left more likely in kids. And what's really sad for me is that I've watched these moving into younger and younger age groups. Dementias in young people, in middle-aged people sometimes. And cancer, migraines, depression, insomnia, sensitivity in our young people, in our children, escalating. And I'll show you some evidence of that in a moment. So we've talked about general literature reviews focused on oxidative stress. But to broaden that and just give you a broad brush approach, there are tens of thousands of research papers in general looking at EMF, but they're not all going to be relevant to your specific questions. That's a, a very big database. Of course, there's inconsistency. Of course, not every single paper conducted shows harm. Biological systems are not linear. They don't behave in a predictable way. And when you're looking at lots of different endpoints and health effects, some of them are going to show nothing. Obviously, the ones that you care about are the ones that show something. Loosely speaking, when you look at the effects that you think should be related, the majority demonstrate harm. Oxidative stress is one of the more extreme examples of that. Um, and this is a study by Henry Lai. I'll show you this because um, some years ago now, he did a broad search, and this one was looking at cell phone use and showed that, roughly speaking, nearly 70% of studies showed harm from cell phone use. But what was really interesting is if you took out, if you looked only at industry-funded literature, these figures were turned on their heads, and about 70% showed no harm. Now, in courts of law, industry-funded literature have not been accepted. So we, should, we really shouldn't be looking at biased literature. We worked out during uh, issues with pharmacological testing that it's not sensible to allow industry-funded literature into the discussion. But I would point out to people, even if you only looked at the research funded by industry, that tells you there's a 30% chance it's messing up your biology. That's not something I'd be happy with when it comes to a child's health. And you look at risk versus benefit, and we'll, we'll move on to discuss that in more, deta more detail. But in general, um, when you look at independent literature in lots of different reviews, you find this figure of around 70% in lots of different areas showing harm. Um, and this one I just bring in to, to point out and remind us all that, of course, it's not only human health that's at risk here. This interferes with wildlife, animals, plants, which is, of course, what you'd expect from something that is interfering on such a basic uh, biological level. Now, I've already mentioned the Bioinitiative Working Group. You can go to their site, bioinitiative.org, and there are a few useful things there. They're a, they are a prestigious group. They have three former presidents of the Bioelectromagnetic Society, 
And back in 2012, they listed all these effects. Don't try and read them all, but lots of different important endpoints that they were seeing recurrently in the literature. And the reason I mention their website is because some people are really disputing the, the evidence for low intensity effects below safety limits. There are thousands of papers, but quite a lot of them are listed in their pages under low intensity effects, and that's the, um, one of the headings for it. So you can see pages and pages of those and read them for yourselves. Um, now, in 2014, in their update there, they made a very specific comment that wireless laptops and other devices shouldn't be used in schools. I wholeheartedly agree with that, and the evidence for that has done nothing but get stronger and stronger. And they point out sensitive populations include children and include those with electromagnetic hypersensitivity, and the truth is there are many others. A certain number of people in this room are highly likely to fall into one category or another in terms of being particularly vulnerable. Um, and this is part of the 2019 update, so a great group because they keep reviewing new literature. And this is just a broad brush look. Um, the, in red, these are positive studies, effect versus no effect in blue. Looking, this is including some extremely low frequencies as well, but even just the R RF ones. This is looking at DNA damage, the comet assays, and oxidative effects. And you can see quite a dramatic preponderance of effect papers versus no effect. Um, and just to summarise that, looking at neurological effects, because I was talking about those earlier, 72% um, showed effects to neurology. Now, this is really important, but has been massively brushed under the carpet here in the UK. RF was designated as a Group 2B possible human carcinogen back in 2011. And one of the things that held it back, there, there were people within that panel, it was nearly unanimous that it was designated like that, but in general, if people differed, they were saying it should have been a higher category. The reason it wasn't a higher category was, at the time, felt to be because of two issues. Lack of mechanistic data, which is now filled in very nicely, but lack of animal data because the data this was based on was looking already at human studies. We had already shown actually humans get a higher rate of certain types of brain tumours when they've used a cell phone for longer. That's what gave it this designation. But to get a higher category, they needed to reproduce those cancers in animals. Now, only a year later, the same group, the WHO, said, we're predicting a tidal wave of cancers. And there were these question marks everywhere. What, what on earth could be causing that? And it, there's a common sense theme lost here. It was quite astounding for all of us who were working on the subject to hear these groups going, my goodness, why are we seeing more cancers? I'm not saying that all of those are caused by this, but shouldn't we at least be properly assessing that link? And the answer was, it's being assessed, but not on the level that you would have hoped for. And at the same time, now as the years rolled on here, 2018 last year, the CDC saying, we're seeing these rises in paediatric tumours, renal, hepatic, thyroid. Again, they won't necessarily all be caused by this, but there is credible literature on all of these cancer types. Now, in this country, another thing that's misinformation that I've heard a lot is, well, if cell phones were really causing brain tumours, we'd be seeing rises in brain tumours, and we're not. Now, that's wrong on two different counts. Firstly, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see the rises now, certainly not dramatically, because there can be decades from exposure to the manifestation of cancer. We all know that from loads of other carcinogens. But in addition to that, if you look at the tumour types that are directly linked, that were used for the classification of it as a group 2B, that was glioblastoma multiforme. Unfortunately, that's a type of tumour that's usually rapidly fatal within five years. We don't have a cure for it. And that is the tumour type that is rising. It's rising in young people. So this is from the National Office of Statistics, Alistair Phillips and Dennis Henshaw. This is on UK-based figures. The other thing that's said a lot is, well, you, you don't need to worry about it because the risk isn't nearly as high as x-rays or smoking. Now, GBM is quite a rare tumour, that's true. And if that was the only health effect, perhaps people would feel a bit less anxious. But that's really the tip of the iceberg when we look at different types of health effects. But it's also not the only tumour type. Um, I'm going to talk about this statement a little bit more now. Right now, this is classified as less than x-rays and smoking, but that was quite a few years ago. Now, only in 2013, two years after the designation, Leonard Hardell and colleagues, he's, an, he's a scientist who's done a huge amount of work on looking at brain tumours, and, and his, his studies were found to be very high methodology, which is why they were used by the International Agency for Research on Cancer to designate it as a Group 2B. 
And what he said two years after that happened was, actually, we've used the Bradford Hill causality criteria. That's something that was designed in the 60s, but still scientifically very robust. It's these nine points. And they give us a good idea, does A cause B? And he used these criteria and he said, GBM, this glioblastoma multiforme tumour, satisfies these in terms of being caused by cell phones. There was also another tumour, he said, also satisfies these, and that was schwannoma. In this case, it was vestibular, acoustic neuroma of the vestibular nerve, which is where you, near where you hold a cell phone. They are generally benign in humans, but they can, we've kind of moved away in neurosurgery from talking about benign and malignant lesions because in your brain everything can kill you if it's growing because it's a, a, a certain size box so they're still important tumors and he found both of those were causal and so he published then this should be upgraded to a group one known human carcinogen that would have put it in the same category as smoking and smoking x-rays and asbestos so that was in 2013 now, as I said, what held it back was lack of animal data, one of the big things. That is now here. Last year, the two largest animal studies ever conducted looking at RF radiation were published. The first one was this, the National Toxicology Programme in the US. Now, massively well-funded study with a classical design to be relevant to human health. I've heard this criticised for a variety of unscientific reasons, but one is that it was done on rats. And I'm like, yeah, that's how all your drugs are tested. It's how food additives are tested because it is of relevance to human health. If it wasn't, how could we possibly justify the way that we're doing animal testing? Um, in addition to that, um, uh, they've said that there were high intensities used. Now, again, that is classical me methodology because you have to test it to the highest user, don't you? And actually, some of the intensity brackets were absolutely what you could experience as a high-end mobile phone user, so they were certainly relevant. Um, and what they found was clear evidence, I quote from their peer review panel, clear evidence of heart schwannoma, nerve sheath tumour, like the one that people get in the ear from a cell phone, this time in the hearts of animals. They weren't using phones like this. Um, they had a whole body exposure and brain glioma. So that's the other type of tumour that we found in humans. Some evidence, not as statistically significant. And then with less significance, all of these other tumours. And this is not the only study, this is the, one of the biggest studies, but there had been a whole load of animal studies looking at DNA damage and cancer way before this. Now, for those who weren't convinced by the fact that there was quite high intensities used, although it's validated methodology, they can't argue their way out of the next study that was published. So this is another very large scale animal study. This was using very low intensity RF radiation, like the kind you would get from a mobile phone base station exposure. Not a phone to the head or close to the body, but in the distance. And they found the same tumour types again. They found schwannoma of the heart, and it was malignant, by the way, in these animals. It wasn't benign. It was a malignant type of schwannoma. And they found with lower, it didn't become statistically significant, but they did see glioma as well. And on the basis of their findings, they said these are consistent, they reinforce the results of the NTP, and they've called for re-evaluation. Now, IARC have said they are going to re-evaluate it. They've classed it as high priority, but that may take between two and four years, they've also said, whilst 5G is being rolled out. To me, that makes no sense. Um, and it's no surprise that uh, this that was published uh, last year, I believe, by Anthony Miller, David Davis, uh, Lloyd Morgan et, et al., this uh, paper is once again, on the basis of those studies, calling for this to be reclassified as a Group 1. There are some scientists, experts, calling for it to be Group 1, some calling it for, it for it to be Group A, but the 2A. But the truth is, even if it was only a 2A, even if they held it back from a Group 1, 2A substances are not, to my knowledge, allowed in schools. Now, I've talked quite a lot about uh, certain types of tumours, but um, when I said there's evidence for other types, some women have a, a practice of keeping the cell phone in their bra. Some young girls and boys are keeping cell phones in their blazer pockets. And unfortunately, Surgeon John West in the States has published a couple of papers now explaining that he's seeing breast tumours directly behind mobile phones that are carried in bras and desperately asking people to stop that practice. It will say in your manual, don't carry this on your body. It should always be a certain number of millimetres from your body, but that's in fine print, and most people do not know that. Now, if we're talking, if we're focusing on kids here, the other thing we need to embrace is we need to think, well, 
Um, we've talked here about cancers that have found, you know, in lots of different age groups, but what else is killing our kids? And um, brain tumours are certainly up there and increasing. They've, they've overtaken leukaemia as the leading cause of cancer death in kids. But the other thing, which is rapidly escalating, that you all, all know about because it's been all over the press, is that sadness is killing our kids. They are dying at rates of suicide that we have never seen before. So we have to now start considering depression or mood disturbance as potentially a terminal illness in this group for some of those children. And if there is any chance at all that that could be reasonably linked with these exposures, again, everyone's questioning, why is this happening? If it can be reasonably linked with this, we have to take that incredibly seriously. And the answer is it can. This is just one paper. And the reason I've included this is because it happens to key in with the mechanism I told you about. So this again is from Professor Martin Paul explaining how this, uh, this alteration, this an abnormal gating of the voltage-gated calcium channels can lead to neuropsychiatric effects. Now when he lists those, yes, depression is one of them, but actually headache, dizziness, um, demographics and dysesthesias, um, these are sleep disturbance, very important. These are also signs of electromagnetic hypersensitivity. That is what he's describing here. Now the literature, scientifically, on EHS as it's called, is actually immensely strong. It's not getting into the medical doctor forum. So doctors in this country are not properly educated on this condition. It's been proven in double-blind provocation studies that people can sense electromagnetic fields acutely, that means fast, when they're initially exposed, when they're sensitive groups and they get these types of symptoms and often many more. Um, and Wi-Fi, I've talked a lot about mobile phones. Wi-Fi is radio frequency radiation. It is also a group 2B carcinogen. It is usually lower intensity, but not always. It depends how close the device is. Um, and we know that these low intensity effects are really important from the Ramazzini base station study and a whole load of other literature. So we mustn't forget that actually what we're talking about here is all RF exposures. It's not just phones, although there's a lot of data looking at that. Now I've mentioned vulnerable groups and we're, we're here to discuss children, but I just want to mention that a lot of staff in schools will also fall into a vulnerable group and I'm contacted very regularly by staff in various areas, but often in schools because we see some of the highest levels of RF in schools, which is really disturbing. Um, so that would be an occupational exposure in some ways, although it's not classified as that. Um, and these people are approaching their employers, the school governing body often, and saying, I need to be accommodated, I'm having a negative health response. And there's a real problem here in terms of communicating it. But um, we'll move back to children for a moment and I'll explain why they're vulnerable. So some children also have EHS, making them doubly vulnerable. But in addition to that, they've got thinner skulls. Now, your bone is actually a biological tissue. It's a very important one. It's not that that's just a, a neutral shield anyway, but it does give some protection to the delicate brain tissue beneath. And they have very thin skulls, so they get deeper penetration. I'll show you a graphic in a moment to explain that. They also have a higher water content. And you'll know from when you put food in a microwave, bits like tomatoes that have a lot of water get super hot and other bits are sometimes staying cold. And that's because water is a very efficient microwave absorber. They're smaller, they're more enveloped by these fields. Their reproductive organs and all of their other systems are still developing. So they have a lot of what we call stem cells which are exquisitely sensitive to these kinds of radiations. And they get physically higher exposures. And I'll, uh, I said I'd show you a graphic. You can see how the cell phone radiation penetrates so much more deeply there into the brain of a five-year-old when compared with an adult. So bringing us back again to common sense, you might rightly be saying to yourself, hang on, if the International Agency for Research on Cancer have said we think this might be causing cancer in humans and children are dying now at a higher rate than ever of brain tumours, that they're, they're escalating, then why on earth are we not being warned to restrict our children's RF use, and particularly cell phone use? Well, the truth is you are being, you just didn't know about it, most likely. This is a website that's really obscure that nobody knows about, where the chief medical officer says, this is the quote from it, it's quite an industry-friendly quote, because it, say, it says they're encouraging your children to use mo your, their mobile phones less. <laughs> it's interesting wording. I would say what that's saying is your children should only be using phones in emergencies. But the problem is nobody was told. Governors weren't told, parents, no head teachers. Some schools are actually designating homework on mobile phones 
because they didn't know this. And perhaps most importantly, kids weren't told. You know, a lot of children have a good capacity to understand, and if they're warned, they may take that quite seriously. But all of these groups are being disempowered from protecting their own health because that warning was kept very obscurely. The other thing that health advisory groups are saying at the same time as they're saying probably don't use your mobile phone so much is but don't worry about Wi-Fi, that's so weak it can't affect you. Now I've already explained why that's not scientifically true. But to go a little bit further, the irony of this situation and the inconsistency of present advice, at the same time as giving that warning about phones, they supported the one-on-one iPad scheme. Now an iPad or, or another tablet can have a higher SAR or specific absorption rate than a smartphone. And some might argue, yes, but it's okay because they're not holding it to their head. No, they're holding it to their abdominal and pelvic organs, which also have no bone shielding and have been shown to also be sensitive to this kind of radiation, particularly perhaps the reproductive system. So there's, there's total inconsistency. This, the warnings currently are not scientifically based. The other thing that people will think instinctively, but I, I want to explain, is they might say, well, we'll move the routers away because that will help. Now, then you get low in, lower intensity exposures from the router. But of course, that doesn't help with the actual device. They're communicating both ways. Your device is like a small router. It's sending RF out back to the router. And you can't move that away or the kid can't use it anyway. So these children are using devices very close to their body. Moving the router away doesn't change those emissions. But it might drop the intensity from the router. And the problem is, it's not as simple as being about intensity either. I've already said there are low intensity effects, but to complicate it one more level, the truth scientifically is that sometimes low intensity effects can be more substantial in terms of biological disruption than high intensity effects. This is called an intensity window. And it's where you get this enhanced biological activity in a specific intensity window that can be very low. In addition to that, it was never all about power in this debate because there are also frequency windows. It depends on the frequency of radiation as to how biologically active it might be. It depends on the signal type. Information carrying waves that are sawtooth and complex can, have been shown to be more damaging to biology than a smooth sine wave. Um, the polarity, so the other, the other sunlight argument. So sunlight is not polarised. Natural light is not polarised. Man-made fields generally are. And certainly the types of fields you're getting from your router and computers and phones are polarised. That makes a big difference to biological interaction. There are so many differences, I can't cover them all. But, um, and then reflect, so in real life, in the experiments that we do, there's often one field and they're very careful to make sure there's no confusing other fields. But that's not true in your classroom. In your classroom, you've got a whole load of different fields from different devices all overlapping. Some of them will be reflecting off surfaces like a metal filing cabinet or radiator. Now, especially when you get a, a field um, reflect, you can get something called constructive interference. That means you can get hot spots of increased intensity that you'll probably never be able to measure in time and space because they're continuously changing. And that can happen in your room, but it can happen within a child's body. And you will never know about that happening. Or of course, all your children are different too. Some are more vulnerable for, than others for a long list of individual reasons in terms of their personal biology. A total fallacy. Some of the best schools in the country that have offset outstandings are not using RF to deliver their internet. Actually, some of them aren't using screens until kids are about 14, and there are some very strong scientific arguments that that's a step forward for education. But put very simply, this was the parliamentary undersecretary. Now, this is quite an old slide, but I've checked back with the Department of Education about this, and the advice is the same. There are certain, uh, I think there are certain expectations in terms of uh, IT use at some point in a child's development. But in terms of how that internet is delivered, it's the choice of the school. It's your choice. Now that raises a question about accountability, and we'll move on to that shortly. But certainly, you can absolutely have a good ICT mark and have hardwired internet. And to put that in perspective, in terms of techiness, so I would say the, t the military are a pretty techie group. They're not exactly Luddite. And the military are fully hardwired. 
The other, because the other excuse I have is people say, we're going to be chipping over wires all over the place. I'm like, well, we kind of figured that out quite a few decades ago in terms of how to, how to wire a building and not have people tripping over. So actually, the, it's not only the military, the most techie groups on the planet all use hardwired internet because it's more secure, has better longevity and faster, more reliable internet speeds. So I mentioned accountability and the reason this is so important to moving forward is because it's amazing how people start to actually read the science when they think they might be accountable. So to me, this is an essential step, is identifying whose responsibility it is if somebody gets sick, particularly when that's a child. You need to know as a parent who is going to take responsibility for that. Now, I would hope that health protection agencies are accountable. You would hope so. That's their job. And it's interesting that our health protection agency changed their name to Public Health England, which kind of, to me, implies watching the public health, but not necessarily intervening. And that's certainly what's happened in this domain. This is a really important paper. This is from Sarah Starkey, published in uh, looking at the Agni report, which was published in 2012. Now, the Agni report is what is still being used for current guidance to schools like you. It was in my opinion, and certainly in Sarah Starkey's, not a valid document when it was published, but it's certainly not valid now. And she points out in this that it was incorrect and misleading and that there were problems with bias within the group. And to give you a snapshot of some of what's in her publication, and please do actually read it, is she looked at the available data, data sets that they had when they were made the, giving their advice and their summaries and conclusions. And about 78% of papers looking at male fertility from these fields showed damage to male fertility. 94% showed damage to proteins and 100% uh, according to her analysis showed damage to cell membranes. And then in their executive summary, that is all that a lot of people will read, taken together, all these studies pr produce no convincing evidence of health effects. I mean, this complete whitewash, which many of us would quite, find quite shocking. Now we've pulled out some of the stronger health effects, but those are serious issues. There are downstream effects that can have really serious health consequences. And so you question why, why did that happen? This is a group that had a really important duty of care and responsibility, and she raises a conflict of interest that may have been the reason. The chairman of this group at the time of writing the report was also the chairman of one of the standing committees for the ICNRP. They're the group I told you about at the beginning who wrote the current safety guidelines. So what we have here is a situation where the people who wrote the safety guidelines have been tasked with saying whether those safety guidelines are safe. That is obviously a conflict of interest. So you may look a step down when you, when you are a bit disillusioned about the role of health authorities and say, well, actually, industry should take responsibility as well. But the thing is, industry, in their own way, kind of have, in that they've told you very clearly they've never said it's safe. What they've actually said in lots of their literature is that it's not safe. They've got warnings all the way through your device manuals. You go, go home and read them. Um, some of them recommend a really substantial difference between your body and I would say your fingers are your body, they're quite important, and the device. But this is all uh, different cell phone warnings. And what's, but what is concerning, and this is the responsibility of industry that's gone, where this has gone wrong, um, you can look this up, I won't dwell on it, but the phone gate uh, scandal, which was published by Marcarassi in Europe, is showing that 9 out of 10 smartphones in Europe were exceeding the public safety limits when they were used in a normal way, because often we'll push them to our head when we can't hear. And that dramatically increases the intensity of use and um, so they've published all this this is easy to find on the internet and it's also been peer-reviewed and published in uh, this journal by Professor Ram Gandhi so it's no surprise with all these layers of evidence that we're seeing court cases being won for people taking uh, various groups to court and saying my phone caused my brain tumour and they're winning these cases and the problem is that then when somebody's been found accountable who pays the compensation? And um, no insurance companies that I know of will cover. So I don't think any, uh, to my knowledge, and I, I would love to stand corrected, I don't think any school in England is currently correctly insured. If a child develops an RF-related health effect, I don't know how that would be addressed. And um, that should tell you, um, for, for people who aren't scientific, and I, I totally appreciate it can, it can be hard to take on board, you can't necessarily go away and digest thousands of peer-reviewed papers, but this is what these companies do as their raison d'etre. 
they read the literature, they have independent expert analysts looking through all the science because they don't want to insure for something that's going to turn out to be a really serious health risk. So when they fly from this, like birds from a storm, that should tell you everything you need to know. This is Swiss Re, and this is a more uh, up-to-date document. This was published um, this year, I think, yeah, May this year, uh, off the leash, 5G mobile networks. And they're just saying in this document that they're expecting um, claims, health claims, um, especially over the next, beyond three years. And, um, and <laughs> we are now seeing pop up legal firms which are doing no win, no fee legal support for Wi-Fi damage cases. Um, getting back to accountability, I do think it's important that schools have a think about this. If it's your choice whether to use this technology, and um, technically, I know in many cases this isn't happening, but technically there's meant to be a risk assessment when anyone implements something new in a school. Now, there is online a risk assessment, again done by Dr Sarah Starkey, you can look that up, and she's given an approach to how you would make that risk assessment and the answer to that is really quite obvious it's a when you do the risk versus benefit on this one of the reasons that I have been doing my best to help schools in this scenario is because there is nowhere where the playing field is more black and white this use of radio frequency radiation in schools is of no benefit to pupils specifically it's not of enhanced educational benefit. I'm not saying there aren't in unusual individual cases, something that it enhances and makes easier. But usually, with the right support, you can always circumvent that. But you would need to show a massive benefit to offset risks such as GBM tumours, acoustic neuromas, infertility, depression. You would need such huge benefits. We all know that it's not that important. And we win in cases in England. So EHS is being recognised as a disability in English courts, in both adults and children. Now, once a child is found to be disabled by EHS, there is a duty to accommodate that child in keeping with the Equalities Act. We've also got a brain tumour progressing, brain tumour case progressing, and cases will continue to be won and escalate. We don't want those cases. We want to take a sensible, proactive approach to supporting kids before they're sick, not after. When it comes to safeguarding a child, we shouldn't be looking to abdicate responsibility. We shouldn't be going, well, so-and-so says it's okay, so that lets me off the hook, it's okay. Each and every one of us has a personal obligation to do a risk assessment and do what we think is really right. Now, I put this together quite a few years ago um, because I, I guess I wanted people to think about this in common sense terms again. Parents sign consent forms all the time when their kid is going to a museum, for example. And um, if we're being honest here, in, in the medical forum, a consent form is a lot more than that. It has to be as validly reflective of the science as possible. I can't say, oh, I'm just going to take your gallbladder blood that's fine, isn't it, and sign here. I have to explain what the state of science is on that procedure and what their risk versus benefit is. That's a real consent form. Now, if we were going to do that for Wi-Fi in the school, it would look something like this. I consent to my child being irradiated by group 2B possible human carcinogen, exposed to a toxin shown to cause DNA damage and other biological disruptions like multi-organ system disturbance, including reproductive impairment, neurological dysfunction, cardiovascular compromise, impaired learning ability, hormonal disruption. The list could go on a lot longer than that, but I wanted you to be able to read it. Now, also, we have to be up to date. Now, if we're going to update this slide, we have to say, yes, it is currently still a group 2B carcinogen, but by the way, it's been labelled high priority for reassessment, and there are experts, including advisors to the WHO, who said this should now be a group 1, which would put it in the same category as asbestos smoking um, and I'm not alone I, I, <laughs> I wonder sometimes if people in audiences like this feel a bit overwhelmed and, and think about how on earth could we not know this why hasn't anyone told us and I'll tell you why because the problem we've got is scientists and doctors who are doing this research who understand it who know the truth don't have a voice this is not a science battle the science battle was won a long time ago in terms of common sense and protecting kids. This is a PR battle. And industry or anyone affiliated who has something to gain from those groups has a much stronger voice. But what scientists have done for, you know, perhaps the first time in history on this level is come together 
people often say to me, there's no consensus, there's a big debate. I mean, it's hard to call it that because in the independent scientific community, there is consensus. And they are telling you in a number of different appeals to all different groups, including the UN, that this is a really serious issue. Please go and look up these appeals and look at the wording on them. All of these different doctors groups and so many more. Um, and, and what they're saying in these appeals is, in all of them, I believe, protect children from wireless radiation, as, long as, a, as well as a whole host of other things. And if you're not sold on the health benefits of taking RF out of a school, there are a whole load of other concerns which are somewhat linked in various different ways. There's serious problems with addiction. There's problems with interaction with different types of toxins. So EMF fields can, in, can interact with chemical toxins or low frequency fields causing an additive or synergistic health problem. Um, there's issues that we all know of with cyber threats and supervision reduced physical movement, reduced data security, reduced long... And these are a lot of the reasons the military use hardwiring, is to circumvent a lot of these issues. But in school, I think really important, reduced teacher-pupil interaction. <coughs> Actually, the way a child learns best is to look at your face. That, that's how they developed to, re, to absorb information, was to see your face, to feel your passion, to hear your experience. That is how a child learns best. And again, all of the science tells us this. We haven't introduced this to help kids learn better. We think we have, or a lot of people think we have. When you look at the science, that is not what this is doing. So it's, it's not rocket science. If you have a toxin in the environment, the way you handle that is you take away the toxin. And that is the only honest way to address this problem. So we have to reduce exposure to all these devices and so many more. And France is doing this. Well done to them. They have banned Wi-Fi in preschools, they are limiting it in primary schools and other countries are following suit. The American Academy of Pediatrics warned against wireless radiation a really long time ago and said we really want to see hardwired networks in schools and some places are taking that advice seriously. This is um, Oregon State le Legislature from just a couple of months ago I think. They've pointed out that this is an emergency. They've declared it a state of emergency that you, they have to reduce radiation levels in schools while they appraise the science because we did it the wrong way around. And this is perhaps one of, I think, one of the best papers currently out there from a governmental group combined with the Cyprus Medical Association, the Vienna and Austrian Medical Chambers all got together and they have issued this position paper online which I think is brilliantly worded because it's, it's actually genuinely reflective of the science. They've pointed out that this is causing risk of cancer, developmental neurotoxicity, effects on DNA and fertility and hypersensitivity. They point out this is occurring at really low levels of intensity and that the damages could be serious and in some cases irreversible. They recommend, of course, hardwired networks. And then this line I've put in red because I think this is so important. They want parents to be empowered to demand a safe environment for their children. I do not blame teachers and governors for, what's, for what the problem is here. But what I do think is a serious problem is when a well-educated, smart parent who has read the literature comes into school and says, actually, I'm not comfortable with this. I do not consent to my child being irradiated like this. That needs to be taken very seriously. And parents are being dismissed by people that have a lower knowledge level about this than them. And, and what are they supposed to do in that scenario? They have this horrible path in the road ahead where they homeschool their child or they injure their child. I mean, what kind of a choice is that? This is ethically wrong. So in terms of how we actually make the practical changes, I'll be honest, that's a whole day's workshop in itself or at least a whole lecture. And I can't go into all of that, but it's also simple in principle which is you hardwire. You put phones in airplane mode, staff phones should be in airplane mode for their health as well as the kids. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't necessarily need your mobile devices in school anyway. You need landlines, in multiple landlines, where people can receive important calls if they need to. Nothing wrong with that. And one thing that's really important is that schools that have done this are giving me really brilliant feedback. They're saying, actually, we thought it was gonna be a pain and we feel so much better. We're not being disturbed by trivia. There's more peace in their adult working lives as well as better, better situation for the children. Disable Wi-Fi then in the control panels of your computers and disable the Wi-Fi in the routers and use in ethernet cables. This is what we all use, but a lot of people have forgotten that, except the military who are doing it really well. 
maybe that's because of some of the literature for biological disruption originated with military, so they're looking after their biology as well as improved data security. Um, ensure grounding and um, reducing screen light, again that's actually another talk on health, but it is important it's in, and it's part of a sort of holistic approach to improving health for children. Um, and uh, we talked about putting mobile phones in flight mode, but I also want to po point out what people often forget, which is their landlines are often cordless. Now, for many landlines, I would say the vast majority of them, even when they are not being used at all, they are emitting. Both the handset and the base station are continuously emitting RF. And there is no need for that. It's a waste of energy apart from anything else. I don't know why they were even designed like that. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so really, you should have a corded phone. A conference calling phone if you want to multitask, if you feel you have to have a cordless phone, then at least a low radiation eco dex model, which can be put in a mode where it only emits radiation when you're using it. So the highest risk is to you, the user, but the children aren't getting so much, except when it's in use. So all of, there's loads of different measures you can take to reduce exposures. But I'll be honest, again, if we're being purists, if we're being scientific about this, then reducing exposures is a little bit about allowing, like, allowing kids to have late-tar cigarettes because we're saying, well, you've got less of the toxin and that's okay. And I would personally, from a medical perspective, and if I was in a court of law, I would say the only way to defensively, at this point, with the science that we have, protect children, is to totally eliminate these exposures, especially in school, so that, because parents have more control of their environment outside, but they're not being given a choice here. And that means switching everything off, using flight mode, using hard wiring, and well-established alternatives. So much of this discussion in terms of risk versus benefit is about the alternatives, which are excellent, which can give a brilliant IT service. And people, again, I don't want them to feel overwhelmed because other countries are doing this. If they can do it, so can we. Our children are not less valuable than theirs. So yes, we must follow France with mobile phone free schools. Wi-Fi free schools. Follow Russia with lower public safety limits. Follow Sweden with formal recognition of EHS as a disability, which is happening whether people like it or not. It's happening in court anyway. Follow Cyprus with brilliant government awareness campaigns to help parents understand that this is a serious, valid issue. Follow the USA with having proper paediatric statements from notable doctors' groups. Follow Italy with successful litigation. We need to start leading the way and feeling proud to be doing the right thing for our most vulnerable population. So in summary, I've presented that radio frequency radiation can damage health at very low intensity exposures. Present safety standards are not protecting health. There are multi-systemic diseases, multi-systemic multi endpoints that are rising, that are relevant in public health and especially relevant to children. One of these endpoints is cancer, but we've touched on depression and how important that is in kids as well. We've talked about the increased vulnerability and increased exposures of children and how hard wiring is a really simple way to immediately address this problem. Accountability is evolving and each and every person needs to think about their role in that process. And it's not just about could you be sued, it's about can you sleep at night? Are you doing the right thing in your position as a responsible adult? Further RF deployment is forgivably irresponsible, and that's why I'll be lecturing on 5G later on today. People often use this term, the precautionary approach, which is very important legally. I'm not moving away from that. But in real life terms, we have moved way past precaution. We had the evidence for this being toxic in the 60s and 70s. That was the time for precaution. You saw my curve at the beginning of how fast these exposures have escalated. Precaution if it was really precaution, would have happened at the beginning of that curve, not where we are now. So now it's an emergency, not a precaution. I've put together um, a trifold leaflet about Wi-Fi in schools from my group FIRE. We comprise medical doctors, independent medical doctors and scientists from all over the world. And um, they have endorsed, uh, the one I've done for 5G, they've endorsed that. I'm finishing this one off now. And once that's been put together and uh, endorsed by all of our groups, we'll put that online to be downloadable as well. And it just, I'm trying to give some really basic information to people who deserve to know it. And this is uh, some points of action of my group fire. You can join this group online, and there's even a way for you to explain what your background is, because we really desperately need 
um, I, when I first started in this subject, I saw the opportunity for both a grassroots campaign and a sort of top-down approach, speaking to prime ministers and ministers and health authorities. And I found it interesting in my own head. I thought, which one of these is going to win? Um, is going to actually be successful in protecting children. And the years that have rolled by, I think it's mums, dads and teachers. So please do join us and um, let's all move forward to a healthier situation where we're sincerely protecting children instead of talking about it.